Boker Tov. Please let me know if you can hear me by just giving me a thumbs up, whether human or through artificial intelligence. I'd prefer an actual human appendage. Boker Tov, good morning. Mo'adim l'simcha, for those that are celebrating Pesach, Passover, my name is Rabbi Or Rose, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the co-hosts and facilitator for this morning's session. I'm joined by an array of talented and compassionate folks this morning. I need to begin by saying that when we originally planned this program, we planned it with Rabbi Ellen Bernstein in celebration of her commentary on Shir HaShirim, her commentary on the Song of Songs. And so this gathering, of course, is more than bittersweet. None of us expected that this would become a memorial service and program in honor of Ellen's life and legacy. But here we are, as we near the end of Pesach, in synagogues throughout the world yesterday, people chanted the Song of Songs as part of their tefillot, as part of their prayers. And in that spirit, we are here to explore the great song, and we're here to give thanks and to carry forth Ellen's beautiful life's work and legacy. And so we'll move between personal reminiscence, song and chant and conversation about the song using Ellen's words largely as guideposts for our exploration this morning. To begin with, I want to uh, thank both Aleph, the Alliance for Jewish Renewal, and B'nai Or Boston for serving as co-hosts with the Miller Center of Hebrew College. And uh, with that, I want to turn it over to the spiritual leader of B'nai Or Boston and a good friend of Ellen's, uh, Ariel, if you would. Thank you everyone for being here. As Orr said, this is a this is a bittersweet moment, and it's also a moment of gratitude that we were able to transform this event into something that can honor Ellen's life and Ellen's legacy. I am the spiritual leader of B'nai Or Boston, as Orr mentioned. I'm also a rabbinical student with the Aleph Ordination Program, and most importantly for our time here today, I was a dear friend of Ellen's. Ellen was a, a teacher of mine. Uh, not because she tried to be, but because of the way she lived. She taught me that holiness is wholeness, and she really lived that way. She made me feel always like all of me was welcome in our friendship, and she reminded me of our belonging to the more than human world. So I'm going to offer a prayer in the form of a song that I wrote for Ellen after she passed, and I want to invite you, um, we're going we're gonna to sing this song twice, but for this first time, as we open, I want to invite you just to close your eyes or soften your gaze and, and really receive this prayer. And then at the end, when we close our time together, I'll invite us all to sing it together. I was a robin Build your nest, lay it down softly and slow. If I was a robin, I'd build your nest, call you through branches back home. I was a blossom, I bloomed just for you, opening, folding, 
your gaze. If I was a blossom, I bloom just for you. Dream of to dandy. Turn back the tides, shine silver and true on each wave. If I was the moonlight, I'd turn back the tides, light you a path through. If I was a cornstalk, I'd grow tall and green, rise up to meet all your peers. If I was a cornstalk, I'd grow tall and green, invite Oh, if we were a story, I'd tell it again, sing it all night and all day. invite Rabbi Kaya Stern Kaufman now to share a personal reminiscence of her dear friend Ellen. Hi everyone. Thank you Ariel that was so beautiful. I first I first met Ellen in rabbinical school at AJR in Riverdale about 15 years ago. She was by then a published author many times over, and I was a serious fan of her work. I remember that we met in a hallway, and as the school was rather small, I immediately recognized her as a newcomer, and I asked her name because I didn't know what she looked like. When she told me her name, my response was, you're the Ellen Bernstein? <laughs> oh, I love your work. And as Ellen often felt that her work was underappreciated, my response totally delighted her. She blushed and she giggled like a young girl, and we became fast friends. How thrilled I was to sit in classes with Ellen to experience her facile mind, her probing questions and her clarity in challenging all kinds of assumptions. She always brought into the horizon of my view and sparked new ideas that would lead us into years and years of discussion in pursuit of God, community, and beauty. Ellen was a great lover of beauty. In the time that I knew her, she lived in three different homes and in each one, she created gardens that overtook me each time I beheld those flowers. From the first time that I met her, Ellen was on a path to revive beauty as a potent and necessary value on the spiritual path within Judaism. Ellen was in pursuit of truth, and she understood that the appreciation of beauty was a necessary element in bringing balance 
back into Jewish life and beyond. Ellen was a natural scholar, though she always claimed that it was not natural for her and that she struggled immensely to formulate her ideas. Perhaps she would have appreciated the term philosopher, maybe a little better to describe her work. She was always asking herself and others deep questions about God, the function of religion, and how we could get it right. She was always rethinking and challenging assumptions. This was the air she breathed and the water she swam in. Our friendship was tied together through our mutual love of nature and our shared desire to reclaim a wholeness that we both felt had been lost in Jewish life. And so Ellen became my thought partner, a beloved friend with whom to wrestle ideas, with whom to wrestle together with God and with Jewish community. Whether hiking or swimming together, our conversations always revolved around Judaism, God, and community. My friend Ellen loved community so much. She was nourished by it, frustrated by it, and deeply invested in it. Like the lovers in Shira Shirim, she devotedly sought out its companionship, its treasures, even if at times it was elusive to her. It was in community that she sought and found the beloved. Ellen was a devoted, loyal, and supportive friend to me. My woes were her concerns and my joys her jubilation. She was a supreme networker, always wanting to connect and share herself and her other friends with me. She was my loving support, and I hope I was to her as well. Ellen's great desire was to impact the world for healing through her work, to bring us back into holiness, W-H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S. -S. Her book, her commentary on Shira Shirim, her last book, is the culmination of her seeking, and it expresses the fullness of her inner beauty her desires, her love. It is our treasure, and I pray that on some level she might know how priceless is her gift to us all, to the world that she so loved. Thank you, um, Ariel, specifically Ariel Hendelman, for giving me this opportunity to share my friend Ellen with you all. Thank you very much, Rabbi Kaya. That was beautiful. Thank you to Ariel. May Ellen's soul be bound up in the bonds of life. Amen. It's now my honor to introduce briefly my two discussion partners for the next half an hour or so, along with Ellen through her words in her final book that Kaya just made mention of, are Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker and Rabbi Dr. Natan Margalit. And uh, rather than me reading their CVs to you, I'm gonna ask each of them just for a moment or two to say something about yourselves, something that feels authentic to this moment. You're both highly accomplished people, but here we are mm -hmm. in this tender moment as we edge towards the conclusion of Pesach and remembering open-heartedly <clears throat> our beloved friend and colleague, Ellen. So Mary Evelyn, my teacher, my mentor, my friend, if you would just say a word about who you are in this moment, in this time, in this place. Well, thank you, Or, and thanks to all who preceded um, this discussion. So beautiful. I think we are moved by the tenderness. I love that word, Or. And Ellen, you know, the more I was reading and thinking about 
this moment and I'm so honored to be part of it because she was very special as we know. And I think what I want to just hold up about, is about her, not so much about me, but, and I think the relation though, relationship is about women and women struggling for their voice as Rabbi Kaya just said. And what strikes me as so powerful about Ellen and all of us, <laughs> um, women in academia, women outside of academia, women in ministry and rabbinical schools, we are very vulnerable. We are very sensitive, sometimes oversensitive. And yet I suspect everyone here, male and female alike, has persisted through hurt and disappointment and struggle. And that is what Ellen really represents to me. You know, we were we were good friends, and I tried to encourage that voice that she had that's been mentioned already, because it's a voice of authenticity. She owned who she was. It's a voice of knowledge. She studied what she needed to know, and it's a voice of compassion. And that's what I salute today in Ellen. Amen. Okay, Mary Evelyn, since you didn't say a word about yourself, <laughs> it falls on me to do so. <laughs> like Ellen Bernstein, Mary Evelyn Tucker is one of the matriarchs of the modern <laughs> spiritual movement for ecological responsibility and justice. As many of you know, Mary Evelyn and her wonderful husband and partner, John Grimm, are the founders and co-directors of the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And uh, if you ask anyone that is involved in this field of eco-theology about Mary Evelyn, I think among the first things they will say in addition to her brilliance is a word about her kindness. So thank you so much for agreeing to be here and for the words that you just said and the wisdom that you will share as this conversation unspools. <laughs> Rabbi Dr. Natan Margalit, if you would, who are you? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Or it, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here and to be, uh, to be uh, in this dialogue with you and Mary Evelyn. And... Um, yeah, I was just thinking about you know I was thinking about spirals as as we like to talk about in this in this work, and how almost, probably around twenty years ago or so that I was working with Ellen on her master's thesis at Hebrew College, talking about these same these same things, and um, and as everybody has has mentioned, we've had you know we've had a relationship sometimes sometimes you know sort of butting heads and and feeling that kind of that competition as we all sometimes do in this in this world but also helping one another writing uh, writing uh reviews for her book or she connecting me with her networking uh, all of those things and then finally just this last fall um mm -hmm. appearing with her in this moment magazine uh dialogue online which was uh the the closest we've worked together in in, in many many years and it was just a Wonderful to see how uh, how our work has sort of like come together toward this toward this goal of of seeing wholeness in the world and how how that is really amazed amazing how much I appreciated this book I think really is the culmination of of her work so uh, it's a privilege to be here and again I didn't say much about myself <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> You're 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 following in in good footsteps. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Natan Rabbi Dr. Natan Margalit is founder, president, and principal teacher of Organic Torah. He is a longtime leader in the Jewish renewal movement. He's a scholar both of rabbinics and of eco theology. He has his own recent book, which is the culmination of many years of study and teaching, but not the last of his publications. And uh, he has been a dear friend uh, to me and a chavruta in different ways, professionally and personally. And it happens to be that though we are on Zoom, <clears throat> probably um, could jog if either of us jogged <laughs> or, 
over to the other's house in West Newton in three minutes or less. Mm -hmm. But here we are together through the magic of Zoom. I'm going to share my screen and um, start our conversation with a quote from Evelyn and then uh, from Ellen, and then I'll invite Mary, Evelyn, and Natan to comment. You see before you uh, different visions of Ellen, including most importantly in this moment, the young Ellen who is there in a raft <laughs> in the Sierras. And this is an opening kavana that she offers in her book. I'll read it to you in full because I think it sets the stage for everything else that we're going to discuss this morning. For several years as a young adult, I worked as a river guide in Northern California. In those halcyon days, when the long rainy winter was over and the earth began to warm, my friends and I would drive to the foothills of the Sierras each year to greet the spring and begin to scout the rivers. In the evenings, my friends and I would gather around a campfire and share the poetry of our favorite nature writers. I remember someone reading aloud a short passage from the Song of Songs. The Judaism of my childhood had never spoken to me these words from the Bible opened my heart. Get up, my beloved, my beauty. Come away, for now the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The scarlet blossoms are shimmering in the land. The time of the songbird has come. The voice of the turtle is heard in our land. This passage, Ellen goes on to say, perfectly captured my own experience of spring. Whatever divinity I knew seemed to be bound up in this bodily experience of spring, of color, smell, and sound, of this torrent of energy and this romance with the earth, that the song could articulate something I didn't have language for, that words from my own tradition could be meaningful, comforted and delighted me. So Mary Evelyn and Natan, in that spirit, I wanna begin with a personal question. Ellen describes evocatively, tenderly, her awakening, if you will, to spiritual ecological work and the place of the song. Before we turn to Shir Hashirim proper, Mary Evelyn, I just wanna ask you about the beginnings of your journey. You've been a leader for so long in this field now, <laughs> we may forget that you too <laughs> was a novice. You were a beginner at some point. How did that start? Take us back. Well, thank you, Or. <clears throat> The, um, I think we all have these amazing experiences as children, frankly, and I did have wonderful upstate New York uh, experiences where my grandfather, who taught at Columbia, had a he, he had grown up and it was along the Susquehanna River. So that was very, very formative, the, the countryside of upper state New York. But I wanted to actually just highlight something that really broke me open in a new way. And that's when Nixon got elected I said, I'm leaving the country. I was a 60s person, as many of you are. And I said, this is crazy. I went to Japan to teach. And what opened up to me in the gardens in Kyoto, the Zen gardens, was a tremendous sense of what we're talking about today, an ecological spirituality, something mm. beyond words, but experienced. And one day, I sat in this magnificent uh, it's called the Silver Temple with a raked garden of stone and moss and pine trees. And it was winter. There was almost no one in Kyoto. It was so cold. And there was mm. no one in this garden. And I just sat there quietly meditating. And all of a sudden, it began to snow. And I was like, this is extraordinary. There's something so much larger than us. This garden is revealing it. 
And it changed my life and opened me up to Asian traditions, which changed my life. So I'll just leave it at that. It was an extraordinary opening to the cosmos uh, and in ways that I'll never forget. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Natan, what about you? Yeah, thank you. Um, let me actually, I'm going to get up and show you something. Because uh, <laughs> I realize that I have drawings and paintings all over my all over my office of um, where I grew up in in Hawaii, and I think it really starts. So this is just like a, a little uh, drawing that I made. This is right across the street from my house, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is where I grew up, um, and the the banyan tree, which I which I talk about in my book, um, but it's just, if you could just see, it's just kind of like, I live in this, like, it's a jewel. This, <laughs> all the sky, the ocean, the, the, the hills, the trees, it all is just like so amazingly uh, beautiful. And I think that it was really more gradual for me. It was more like a sense of integration mm. uh, and uh, realizing just, you know, soaking this in and then, Kind of taking it for granted for for a long time and for me it was really my i came through it i think through that sense of the desire for wholeness hmm. and when i started when i w was in israel in my early 20s and started being exposed to to jewish learning something clicked in me that, that this kind of this kind of textual learning is really different than whatever i experienced in school and it's much more organic and it doesn't follow the same rules. And I followed that thread uh, really my whole life to uh, to see like, how is how is that world of, as, as Ellen likes to talk about ecology and that, and that sense that everything, nothing is wasted and everything is connected in these networks. That's just, uh, that that's all comes together and um, and so it's just sort of a quality of, of, of uh, integration. And I think most recently coming back to the where I grew up in Hawaii and actually really coming to appreciate the native Hawaiian uh, religion and ecology and what they're doing and what's actually even happening right exactly in my, in my front yard with uh, renewal of some of the Hawaiian fish ponds. And I'll talk more about that later, but it's to me, it's more a sense of like trying to be make conscience make conscious what i think i picked up as a child beautiful hmm. thank you to both of you so i want to turn back to a quote not from ellen but one that she liked very much that she cited several times including at the beginning of her book so i'll share my screen again i'll read it and then ask you to comment on this quotation And I hope everyone can see my screen. Just give me a thumbs up again. Technology is awesome when it works. Mm -hmm. So this comes from the indomitable Gus Speth, who was, among other things, is, among other things, the former dean of the Yale School for the Environment. And uh, this is a famous statement that he made some years ago. I used to think the top global environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we would address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we lawyers, not scientists, as is sometimes misquoted, <laughs> we lawyers don't know how to do that. So that is the quotation from Gus. And Ellen, in quoting him at the beginning of her book, says that in fact, this became her life's work related to what Kaya said before, that it was to try and provide as many people as possible 
with spiritual and cultural resources. So I want to ask each of you again to think about a resource other than the song, because we'll come to that in a moment, but something along the way that has helped you to open your own heart and to open other hearts beyond the hard facts of climate crisis. So Mary Evelyn, I'll ping pong it back to you. Well, thank you, Or, And Gus, of course, was our Dean at, uh, at Yale. He was here for 10 years and he's a very close friend. We saw him right after the eclipse up in Vermont, stayed with him overnight and uh, he is absolutely remarkable and in fact he's the reason one of the reasons that we came to Yale from our work at Harvard because yeah. that quote so uh, you know it's hard for people to realize in <clears throat> the science and policy community that values matter and that's why this religion and ecology has been such a uphill struggle within academia um, but we have wonderful colleagues here like Hava Samuelson who helped a lot in the Judaism and ecology volume but I want to say um, that we were, were we going to the communion of subjects um, slide? Yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so I would like to just say that a person who influenced many of us, <clears throat> um, along with Gus, is Thomas Berry, who was our teacher, John and my teacher, and many, many others. A thousand people came to his memorial in New York at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. But this particular quote um, the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects, is something that's inspired so many of us. Um, we've edited his works, and so we, we know almost every line pretty well. Um, but he had, as Ellen did, and I like to say does, because this book is a living book, he had this most extraordinary sense of the need for the re-enchantment of the world, as Max Weber helped us understand too, for a sense of the living earth community as mm. many people are beginning to inhabit. Um, as Netan just said in Hawaii, and we've spent time there too, and the Hokalea revival of the overseas voyages is just a magnificent example of this presence of things, including the oceans, the water, the birds, and so on as they navigate. So what Barry was inviting us to, and as indigenous peoples are, is a re-inhabiting of this living, breathing, throbbing, vibrant earth community. And that includes not just humans, but the more than human world, as we know very, very well. And <clears throat> so I, I could talk a lot about this, but I'll just say there's a presence in everything. <clears throat> We're yeah. all living in this beautiful season of spring, and we feel the presence, the unfolding. And that is what a communion of subjects means. It's another version of Martin Buber, if you will. The I, thou, the reciprocity, the relationality, the interdependence, the resonance. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, it's very familiar in your own traditions of various forms of Judaism and the other traditions as well. Mm. So. I thank Thomas thank Berry for his insights. <clears throat> Amen. And before going to you, Natan, I just want to say one of the joys of a gathering like this is also to point out our rootedness. And in that sense, in this moment, I mean the genealogy of teachers that have come before us, <clears throat> of those that have lived on the growing edge, to quote the great. Reverend Howard Thurman, mm -hmm. who of course then bequeathed that term to a teacher who is familiar to many on this call, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, who utilized that term creatively. And to think about Barry, and to think about Teilhard de Chardin in this context, and to think about you, Mary Evelyn and Ellen, and what we call in Hebrew, the shalshelet, the chain of tradition and transmission. Just as we are rooted in the earth, we're also rooted through a communion of souls, of human beings. So thank you. Call on the, on the ancestors in that sense. And with that, 
Natan, I'm going to go to you because you chose the following quotation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to read it in part or whole or just comment on it. Yeah, well, um, let me just comment because it really is coming to the same thing that uh, that Mary Ellen was pointing out. It's really the subjecthood and the sense, um, and just the just that last sentence um, that you know that Robin Wall Kimmerer says, which is, um, you know, there are intelligences other than our own, teachers all around us. Imagine how much less lonely the world would be. And this is, I mean, this book has just been a very influential book for me. It's a beautiful book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And um, the, you know, and it just really struck me how we have grown up in the Western world with this, with this really damaging loneliness that we, you know, that we're taught that we are alone in the world and how much different that, that is for those people who have grown up in a different kind of culture. Where, where they're really taught as, you know, as, from childhood, our, our connection to the more than human world. And that's something that has influenced me very deeply. And uh, it's something that I try to, try to learn later, you know, later in life, but try to practice as I'm uh, taking out the compost or gardening in my garden or walking the dog or, or hiking or whatever it is I'm doing to be aware of the of the intelligences around us and the beings and that intersub intersubjectivity. So mm -hmm. I tried to bring in Robin Wall Kimmer, who is uh, from an indigenous tradition and, and does what I think a lot of us are trying to do, which is trying to integrate the, that that growing edge of, of science with indigenous and traditional wisdom. Beautiful. Mary Evelyn, go ahead. Thanks. I'd love to just bounce off of that uh, lovely uh, comment, because I think this is so crucial, and it's so what Ellen was about. There, I wanted to mention, at the Divinity School, just in the last couple of years, uh, Willie Jennings is teaching a course titled Animacy and Natural Theology, and we sat in on it this semester. Mind-boggling. Absolutely fabulous. And it's all about the sense of, of presence and, and so on. We did in the Harvard conferences a conference on communion of subjects. It was published by, by Columbia. But Barry did the opening talk, and it was loneliness and presence, picking mm. up on this last line here. And just one final point, because I think this is so exciting. And this is the continuity of Ellen's work. At NYU, uh, about 10 days ago on Friday, they had a whole day conference on the consciousness and sentience of the more than human world with scientists and neurobiologists and so on. Absolutely fantastic. At the end, a declaration for animals, uh, but this goes from insects through invertebrates and vertebrates and so on. And this is what's exploding, both in the animal behavior world, in the nature writing world. We've had webinars here at Yale with literally 4,500 people signing up to listen to Robin Walkimmer, David Haskell, Song of Trees, and Rob McFarland. Farland. People are so hungry for this. And that's why Song of Songs is such a great, extraordinary book. Mm. So turning to Shia Shirim, to the song, one of the things uh, that Ellen found so moving about it is that according to rabbinic tradition, many of you know this tradition from the Mishnah, from the earliest stratum of rabbinic discussion, mm -hmm. is this quotation from Rabbi Akiva, that the song of songs is the holy of holies. And Alan, like so many other commentators, asks, what did he mean by that? Especially since there's no reference in Shir Hashirim to the divine. And it certainly doesn't speak in what we would describe as a conventional <laughs> religious language. And so what makes it holy and what makes it not only holy, but Kodesh HaKodeshim, the holy of holies. And part of what Ellen arrives at through her research 
going all the way back, Natan, to those days at Hebrew College when you and I had the privilege of being her teacher. <laughs> um, she talks about Shir Hashirim as being related integrally to Gan Eden, to the Garden of Eden. And there she says of Gan Eden that the story begins beautifully, but then there is this three-way fracture between man and woman, between people and the land and its creatures, and between people and God. And then the song comes along and in its own way serves in its lushness, in its vitality, as a restorative medicine, Ellen says elsewhere. I love that mm -hmm. because the song is so much about embodiment so that it provides a kind of redemptive medicine. And we return to a notion, as more than one of you have quoted Ellen as saying, to holiness, W-H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S. -S. <clears throat> so I wanted to ask each of you again to comment on a specific image or phrase or verse from the song that moves you. So Natan, you spoke about the following, and I included Ellen's comment on it, but if you would in your own words, what is it about this chapter and verse? I am my beloved's and his desire, chukato in Hebrew is for me. Thank you, Or, yeah. No, it's... Um... I guess what what really is powerful for me in this is is that the beautiful just I love the intertextuality of the song and the way that it is layered like you can pass through that line and in in, in in you know in uh, chapter seven verse eleven in in the Song of Songs that is I am my beloved and his desire is for me you can just pass that by. But if you see that word, chuka, such an unusual word, and it really has got to take you right back there to that fracture, that, that, that was that break. And it is clearly a healing of that, of that fracture. It's clearly that, that sense of hierarchy of man above woman that seems to be set in, that, in, the, in the curse after, after Eden. And uh, so clearly a statement that that curse was never meant to be, never meant to be permanent. And that it was meant to, as you know, as something that should be healed. And that it comes back to a sense of mutuality and equality between, between genders. And so that's just a wonderful, uh, you know, a wonderful example of, of that, of that sort of like the, again, the spiral coming back to the garden renewed and this time healed i also just wanted to to bring in because you talked about the holy of holies and uh you know another ellen, ellen davis talks about like the three gardens because the yes. garden in between there's the garden of eden the temple the, the ancient temple which was also seen as a garden and that was also not quite complete didn't quite work out until we finally get to the to the healing of the third garden Beautiful. Thank you so much, Natan. And as Ellen writes, of course, in this image of reciprocation and balance relationally between the raya and the dod, the male and the female, the female and the male, there is a gesture, of course, towards the possibility of a restored relationship, which is balanced and reciprocal between humankind and the rest of the natural world, and of course, the divine. So Mar Mary Evelyn, you actually um, asked to look at this set of verses, which I quoted from Ellen's awakening in <laughs> the Sierras. So if you would, what moves you about this particular verse or this cluster more appropriately of verses? Well, I think it moves many people, doesn't it? Because it's <laughs> so rich, so poetically versatile, and 
you know, I'm a person who appreciates translation because I've done it from the Japanese. And I know this is, you know, the way people have poured over this text yes. and how they they translate it. And this is the beauty of the <laughs> Jewish tradition and translation commentary and so on. Um, so I just think, picking up on what um, Tan has just said, um, you know, it's it's a human instinct, isn't it? But I just do want to say, as a woman, <laughs> those lines, my beloved, my beauty, come away. Everyone wants to think of themselves in some way as beautiful inside or outside. So mm. that's the thing, the evocation of beauty in the person, mm. so powerful, so real. And then I think these lines of now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. We've just had rain this morning here in Connecticut and helping the flowers to stay on and uh, that we can enjoy their deliciousness. But that line too, the winter is past, this tremendous sense of seasonal cycles on the one hand, renewal, of course, on the other, but it just to me exudes hope and possibility in times, as we will talk about momentarily, of great challenge, of great sorrow, of great suffering. This, these lines lift us up, I think. And then, you know, the, the blossoms, they're shimmering in the land. I love the, the scarlet bl blossoms because the, or the cherry blossoms, because this is what the Japanese love. They love to watch them. They love to feel them. They love to sing about them, sit under them and drink sake and have good food. And they do that all through Japan, all through the springtime. And they mar they go right up the islands uh, mm -hmm. with that celebration. Everyone's focused on it in the news and, and so on. So that sense of watching blossoms unfold and disappear, that's a very rich sensibility. Um, and of course, the, the birds, this is Rachel Carson, the birds, are they going to return? Uh, what's happening to them? And then the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. You know, people are waiting for these, for the turtles, but they're waiting for the frogs and the peepers to come back and give us that symphony. I uh, walk down the street every evening when the peepers are here and I just, they, they throb with possibility and a music beyond what we can imagine. So this is just one of the most beautiful works in all of literature, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your exposition too. Natan, go ahead. Yeah, I also just want to comment because I think this was something for me, one of the most powerful thing in, in Ellen's book, the way she emphasized the sort of rhythmicity that 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 it's not, a, we kind of always expect in the, the song to be like a happily ever after. And it's like, and it's not that happily ever after. It's all connected to the seasons and the seasonality and it's and it's constantly changing in connection to the changing of the seasons. And that that I thought that was very powerful the way Ellen brought that out um, because it really is it's like it it's connected to the land and there's there's a rhythm to love and it's not always close it's you know and if it's far away it's going to come back close again and it's uh, so I just thought that was beautiful and this is one this is one season yeah well said that too Natan I I picked up on in my reading of the book this time is uh, this notion of the rhythms of life mm -hmm. and the repeated declaration by the Raya, by the heroine of the story, that there is a time and place for everything. And that even as you are yearning, even as you are longing, that love, like the seasons of the year, will come when it is ready and that if you press too hard if you rush too soon that it can be spoiled and that's a hard lesson for us to hold that is intellectually we can understand it ambiently we can experience it but when you have that rush of emotion when you feel overwhelmed whether it's by love or by hate how do you keep in heart and mind that there is a pacing? And that leads me to my next question for both of you. We are living oy, 
Gewalt. <laughs> Fill in other exclamatory expressions in Yiddish or other languages. In such a topsy-turvy world, in a time of great pain, in a time where the pain of Israel-Palestine or Russia-Ukraine or Givalt, the upcoming election in this country, any one of those would be more than enough to arrest our full attention. So here we are calmly, reflectively engaging in tech study, in music. And I wanna ask you how you understand the relationship to what we are doing here and now to the quote unquote real world problems that feel like they are just running off the tracks. How are you coping? And you don't need to polish your answers. We don't need Pollyanna, but give us something from the kishkas, even lower than the heart, from the gut. <laughs> how are you holding these things and how might this exercise this morning actually be helpful to us as uh, we think about winding down Pesach and turning in a more full fledged way back to the, to the problems of the world. Mary Evelyn, our teacher, our guide, <laughs> help us. <laughs> well, such a powerful question. It's the question, isn't it? Um, and I hope you're going to ask your final one, because I do have an example I'd like to share from the, yes. the Middle East. So I'll, I'll just jump into this one first and say, we dwell in unknowing, absolute unknowing. But we also dwell in history, and there's almost no tradition that knows history as well as Judaism. And that will be a source of consolation, of frustration, but I think of hope. Um, and I've been thinking more recently, so here's my hopeful sign or to offer. Um, my grandfather was a founder of the National Conference of Christians and Jews in 1926, and it was one of the very wow. first religious, uh, interreligious organizations, um, even in the West. Yes. And he stayed with it. He was a professor of European history at Columbia, but he, he shared it with Roger Strauss and a, a mm. Protestant. Um, and he was with it for 20 years. Um, and it was dealing with the same kinds of things we're dealing with now. Anti this, anti that, you name it. Um, but I also want to say that in terms of um, well, religious relations, as difficult as they are right now, we have to remember that the Catholic Church said there's no truth outside of any religion except Catholicism. You couldn't even enter another Protestant church or whatever. We have come a long, long way, and thanks to Vatican II and so on, in interreligious relations. And I've just been, I've just written something on this. So this is very much in my mind. We've come a long way. We have a long way to go. A meeting like this is extremely helpful. And let me just say one other thing about history uh, that's come across my consciousness more recently. Out of war has come some significant changes. My grandfather said to the history department at Columbia, after World War I, we have to teach European history. Mm. We have to understand it. They created Western civilizations. After World War II, of course, that increased for obvious reasons, but also those who fought in the Pacific War, including my teacher, Ted DeBerry, who was a student of Carlton Hayes, my grandfather, he brought Asian studies to bear. All of the great Asian scholars got their training in the Army and Navy language schools. So we've got Western history, we have Asian history from the Vietnam War, an army major came back to the University of Hawaii, actually, Richard Stevens, and said, we've got to teach world history, mm -hmm. uh, which I taught after we graduated. I finished my PhD. Incredible breadth. And then the final leap has been into what's called big history. And of course, a sense of universe story. We have to tell the whole. But that's just in a very short period of time, I mean, our lifetimes, really, that we have a sense now of the histories of the world as lineages and legacies, to pick up your, your point. And the ancestors who've created this, um, we have something to build on and go forward with. 
both in terms of interreligious relations and in terms of a breadth of history and culture that's now alive and with us. So we can go forward with that. Beautiful. I just want to underscore what you said by using two terms that have been helpful to me when thinking about pain mm -hmm. and loss, whether it's individual or whether it's collective, which is we don't prescribe pain and loss as tools for learning and growth, but descriptively, they can be true, as you're saying, if we open our hearts, if we open our minds. Yeah. And as it says in the Megillah of Esther, mi yodea, who knows? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's great wisdom in what you're describing as a kind of epistemological humility, which we are so lacking in the midst of all of this warfare, all of this bloodshed. And so we would certainly not prescribe <laughs> any of the great aches and pains that we're going through. But descriptively, we know that human beings have the capacity to learn from their mistakes and that new vistas are on the horizon if we can look up yeah if we can look out so thank you so much for that mary evelyn natan what about you how are you how are you holding as well, our rabbis might say <laughs> i was going to say one thing but since i since you brought up that that section about um i adjure you the, from the from the you know the the song of songs about the note you shall line that like I swear I, I I adjure you don't don't bring it too early but because one of the things I thought was very powerful that Ellen brought out in her book is the word play there yes the tzvaot and the ayalot asadeh that they're plays on they're plays on words which are reminiscent of names of God. And it's because normally, if you're going to swear, you're going to swear using one of the one of the names, make an oath using one of the names of God. And instead of that, it's using using these the gazelle. And uh, and I thought that that was beautiful in that it really it speaks to the reenchantment of the world that we're talking about. It speaks to that sense that like God is not somebody up there who's making laws and commandments and looking down at us. But in fact, if we shift our gaze and, and get out of our conventional eyes and open our eyes to the divinity around us, so much can change. So much can change if, if we're no longer looking at things in terms of, in terms of nations and competitions, but we actually are are feeling that that security and and the sense of presence. I think people will be so much less afraid, and so much more uh, able to be in their in, in a more rational state of mind, if we really did feel that confidence of God's presence all around us. I and mean, that's a big ask, but that's what <laughs> we're talking about: as that shift to this to to the. Uh, enchantment of the world all around us and it would really shift everything so i'm i have another answer which i'll wait for your next question uh which was what i thought i was going to talk about so i wanted to just mention that okay we may or may not get there because the conversation has been rich but i just want to uh double down on on your wise paraphrase of of ellen natan because i think it was timely speaking of time and place um and just to explain it a little bit further in case anyone miss the Hebrew play, Adonai Tzvaot is, right, the god of legions. It's, you know, the galactic god of the cosmos. And here Ellen is pointing to the fact that in the song, through language play, there's a wink. And the wink involves the presence of God in the beings of these gazelles. And they're the ones that she is adjuring, <laughs> the daughters of Jerusalem, to swear in the presence of. 
which is a kind of wow moment, a kind of ecological click moment right here and now, right? That transcendent presence is here intimately. It is right before you. It's similar to Abraham Joshua Heschel's call when he says, how could it be that the God of the cosmos is concerned about idolatry? The God of the cosmos is concerned about molten objects and trinkets. It seems so beneath that God. And then, of course, tongue-in-cheek, Heschel says, the reason why God is so concerned about the creation of idols is that it is a distraction and potentially a deadly distraction. Because if you would just look to your left or to your right, there you would see the presence of the divine in the face of the other. And here we're expanding that, Natan, it goes to what you and Mary Evelyn have said so beautifully, you know, the more than human. Those are the ones that stand before us and bear witness. So Mary Evelyn, you had a, you had, you had an example that yeah. you want to bring, a very powerful example from, from the work that you've been doing mm -hmm. from the broken heart, if you will, yes, of Israel, Palestine, because you know, so many of us are utterly broken by the latest cycle of violence there. Um, and we need some glimpses of hope. Again, not to be Pollyannish, but to invest in hope. So if, if you're willing to share something of what you observed, it would be helpful, at least to me and perhaps to many others. Wonderful. Well, I think Everett Gendler might be on this call, and I think he's a person who's we can hold up as well for this kind of peacemaking work. But I want to give an example that's really quite moving. So there's an organization um, in the Middle East, uh, actually in, in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Ramallah, um, and so on. It's called, it was initially called Friends of the Earth Middle East. It's now called Eco Peace Middle East. And Gidden Bromberg was the founder. And it's a group of people that's been working, I think maybe 25 years, but it's Israelis, it's Palestinians, it's Jordanians. And it is for peacemaking, um, but in particular over the issue of water. They've been working on the Jordan River, on the Dead Sea, and so on. And they've come forward with a, a blue-green deal uh, for water. And Tom Friedman has picked this up. A number of people have picked it up. They're actually <laughs> being nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. So this particular example of, you can say, interreligious work for the environment and for water to us has always been a luminous example. And I just want to say briefly, because it was so moving, up at the University of Connecticut uh, about a month ago, Dan Wiener, who's the provost for global affairs, has been helping um, this extraordinary group um, in a project that's called uh, Mindfulness for Earth, Mindfulness with a Four Earth. And he raised money to bring a healing for this group through, this goes to Sri Lanka, the conflicts that have been very present there between Hinduism and Buddhism, but also development issues. Ariyatni, the leader of a Sarvodia movement in Sri Lanka, uh, has helped conflict resolution and development and environmental issues out of that movement and a mindfulness from Buddhism transferred to the Middle East through this extraordinary woman, uh, Kumanga is her name, and she has worked for the past months since October 7th to bring reconciliation within this group. The stories are so moving about the hurt, obviously the trauma, the fear, the loss. But with this meditational technique, with peacemaking, and with a sense of the future of this region based on a healthy environment, uh, much progress has been made. So I'll leave it at that. Beautif beautifully said. And uh, Hel Helena, I think your name is, I, I see your hand. We're gonna call on people in just a couple of, a couple of minutes, I promise. 
Um, I want to share one, one other slide with you, which um, <laughs> which involves a quotation from Ellen, and it's one to Natan that you chose. Okay. And um, it's also a piece of artwork because I think again, in the spirit of the song, we want to try and engage different senses. And so often artists, whether musicians like Ariel or Shefa or poets like Yehuda Amichai or Darwish or visual artists like this individual, Edith Krauss, can help us with this project of re-enchantment. And I like it in particular because, and I'll send the slides out if you can't read everything that's on the screen, but to the right is Ellen's call for ecological identity, to expand our sense of identity, which I think is so important, particularly now, when tribalism has taken hold in so many different ways, shapes, and forms. And that kind of extreme tribalism is very different than particularism. We need particularism, just as we need universalism. All of us universally are particular. <laughs> and that's part of what Ellen was trying to describe. Even the garden is a particular garden in a particular landscape, but it partakes of the earth as a whole. And this artist, artist Edith Krauss, went to the West Bank a few years ago. And there she observed the houses and the landscape and entitled this piece Adam Adama, which countless numbers of Hebrew speaking spiritual ecologists have talked about, perhaps most dramatically in our generation, Rabbi Arthur Waskow, Adam and Adama. And the painting is supposed to evoke in us an understanding that we are a part of a habitat that is both human and more than human. And in her depiction, she's also trying through this kind of melange of imagery to point to the genome, the sequencing um, that is also human and more than human. And so you have homes, you have the genome sequence, you have the landscape. And then she says something quite powerful, Mary Evelyn, that was related to your comment about the conflict specifically. Perhaps this visceral attachment to place and history provide insight into the intractability of some conflicts where each side is so profoundly tied to the land as to preclude empathy. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I thought it was counter culturally and counter intuitively profound mm -hmm. because we say oh if we can just turn to the land we'll understand that we all partake of it and that it belongs to none of us but what this artist is also saying is we do have attachments strong attachments to the more than human world that feel like they are our own this is our land. This is our story. This is our history. And we can't share it. We don't have enough empathy to understand that there are other stories, there are other currents moving through the very landscape that, of course, belongs to none of us, even as we're attached to it so significantly. And uh, I thought that was an important part of this exploration of the song, because mm -hmm. it is a garden. It is not all gardens or any garden. And it comes out of a particular culture and history and memory. And yet, it belongs to none of us. Natan, you're going to get the last word in this round. We'll open it to a few comments and questions, and then we'll wind down, I think appropriately with music and chant. Thank, thank you, Or. Yeah, no, I mean, I just was gonna say that the, the, the big picture of what you're all saying, which is that part of this ecological way of looking at the world 
is expanding that sense of self and to say that we're always, you know, in in my book, I talk about it, uh, you know, the connection of Jewish concepts like minyan and systems thought. That is to say, there's always, it's never just me against you. It's really, we are both in there. I'm, I'm both part of the problem and part of the solution, and so are you. And shifting that can shift everything when we shift away from that, like just like me and you to, to both of us together, whether that's in our families or internationally or with the more than human world, that's a shift to, to as you say, to, to expand our sense of identity and saying we are all in this together and there's no getting rid of that other as, as, much, as, as much as there may be history and hatred and all of those things. We have to learn that we are all in this together, that we need to live together. And so that's that's the basic, that's the basic thing that I think we need to shift because we've had so much 400 years in Western culture of breaking things down and going towards this individualism that has broken down that sense of connection. And we mm. need to rebuild that sense of connection. And uh Natan, you remember our Rebbe Reb Zalman saying many, many times, Chevre, the only way that we can get it together is together. <laughs> exactly. It sounds so simple, and yet it is so hard. It feels intractable, but that's the only way, whether today or tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> Helena, is that how you pronounce your name, or? Helena, yes, sorry. yes, Helena, thank you. Yes, go for it. Okay, so first of all, I just had a, a reaction, um, Mary Evelyn, when you said the importance of knowing history, because um, I live in Ontario, in Toronto, actually, and um, I was a teacher, and religion um, was, um, sorry, history was required of grade nine students. And after that, it wasn't required anymore at all. So the importance of being educated with history um, is so essential. And this has always bothered me. And I also, um, by way of introduction, um, I also lived in Israel at the, actually at the time when Sadat came. But I went because I wanted to be part of Neva Shalom, the mm -hmm. community of Jews and Christians and Muslims living together. And I had met Bruno Hussar here in mm. Canada when he talked about it. But when I got there, it was falling apart and he didn't want North Americans. So I never did that. Anyway, I, um, you asked us to share some of our kishkas. And I wanted to say this because it happened um, just last night. I belong to a, a social justice group that is um, inter interfaith. And someone last night, um, actually, I, I read it in the middle of the night, posted something from Sabil, this Palestinian group. And it tore me apart because it basically denied any anything about the Jews having any special relationship in in the Bible. And, um, and it was really about, is it only, um, did God only choose the Jews or also the Palestinians? But... Um, the whole point of it was that the Jews do not have any unique relationship to God and and the relationship with Abraham um, meant nothing special at all. And it went on to the usual stuff about Gaza and Israel. But the only positive thing, I thought, finally, there's something positive, And it said, let us hope for the release of the hostages but that wasn't the end of the sentence. It was, and the thousands of, of Palestinians in Israeli jails. That was the only positive thing in the entire thing. So I was actually late for this this morning because I was dealing with talking to some people about this, but it, it was just unbelievable to me. I appreciate you sharing from the heart and sharing what was, what was painful. And I Thank think you. your two comments, by the way, actually are interrelated, which is about literacy. And through the learning of history and of spiritual and religious traditions, among other things, we can have a greater appreciation 
for why it is that even our so-called enemies have attachments. And in some cases, those attachments are very ancient, as is the case in point. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And also thanks for ending on <laughs> a note of hope that there might be a breakthrough. Others. I just want to say quickly while someone's raising their hand, Lisa Dayhill is on this call as well. And at Hartford International Seminary, they have had a long history of international uh, or interreligious relations. And uh, she has a great new program on spiritual ecology and so on. So Lisa Dayhill at Hartford International Seminary. Yes, a shout out to Lisa and to our colleagues at Hartford, who are part of the Boston Theological Interreligious Institute. There you go. We're all connected. <laughs> and Ruth Gendler is on the line. And of course, uh, someone made mention of the late Everett Gendler, another of the pioneers. Several years ago, Everett came to Hebrew College as a guest teacher. And of course, I knew this was a part of his shtick, but it was a fabulous shtick. It was part of his pocket Torah. He mm -hmm. brought a rabbinic text to study with our students, and then he brought the weather reports from the last week in New England. He said, this also needs to be understood as a sacred text. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. And of course, he'd been doing that for decades, right? What do we consider to be sacred? It was in that spirit that I brought that painting to. And poetry. How can Shir Hashirim be considered by Rabbi Akiva the great sage and martyr in the Talmud to be the holy of holies. It's yeah. just a love poem. Just <laughs> a love poem. I want to also give a shout out for Everett Gendler because when we did our online courses for Coursera and he was even out of the country, but he we interviewed him as one of the really early leaders in this area. And I uh, was so grateful to him. But I also want to give a shout out for uh, Chancellor Ishmael Shorsh at the Jewish Theological Seminary, who opened up the doors uh, when this was a very new idea and introduced us to many faculty there. And his son, Jonathan, as you know, is working very yes. hard on these issues. So, and Arthur Green, we got to give shout outs to lots of these great leaders. And Arthur Wasco, of course, I'm delighted with Mar mentioned. And David Seidenberg, and there's all kinds of people now working on this. Judith Plaskow. It was, um, so just, I think the lineage is growing and it's very exciting. And Hebrew College has a lot to do with that. Thank you, thank you. It, it takes a village and more, it takes a global village. Um, Ariel, I think I'm gonna kick it to you because um, again, both in terms of the modalities of engagement, but also thinking about this chain of transmission you spoke of Ellen as your teacher and your friend. You're on the cusp of becoming a rabbi officially. Uh, I think I've already referred to you as rabbi because you're walking the walk. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to pick it up from here and then to introduce us to one of your teachers, our teachers, that being um, the wonderfully creative Rabbi Shefa Gold. But Ariel, also, if there's anything that struck you in the course of conversation that you want to comment on briefly, Bevakasha, please add your voice to the potpourri of voices. Of voices, thank you. Well, I first just want to say thank you to Or and thank you, Natan. Is my volume okay? Can everyone hear me? Come yeah. a little closer to your computer. Is that better? Uh, thank you, Or. Thank you, Natan. Thank you, Mary Evelyn. This was a just a beautiful and really enriching discussion. Um, really, really appreciated being a witness to it. And uh, I am going to going to turn it over to my beloved teacher, Shefa Gold, in honor of this re-enchantment that we've been speaking about. It's my, my pleasure to introduce her. She's become an ambassador uh, for the Song of Songs in a, in a different way, uh, a different take on it than Ellen had. And Shivim Panim Shel Torah, 70 Faces of Torah. And she's taught me and many others what it means to put love at the center of our lives by putting the Song of Songs at the center of, mm. our, of our spiritual lives. Thank you. Um, Ellen is an old friend and beloved. 
and uh, we shared the Song of Songs. And my path has been to to live every day in the song. And so in thinking about how to receive Alan's legacy and to pass it on into the world, I chose this verse uh, that said, an, an enclosed garden is my sister, my bride, a hidden fountain, a sealed spring. Your watered fields are an orchard of pomegranate trees laden with delicious fruit, flowering henna and spikenard, spikenard and saffron, cane and cinnamon with every tree of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, all the finest perfumes. And it, I chose this verse because it seemed to me that Alan took the journey to that secret garden and she found that hidden fountain, that sealed spring, and she opened it up for herself first. And then really her life was about wanting to bring that, um, the, that resource, that fountain of living waters to the, to the world. Uh, and sometimes I think she would get frustrated when it wasn't received or when people didn't want to go there to that enchanted garden themselves. Uh, so I, I wanted to, to chant these words as, um, as a kind of a, a vow, a promise that, Ellen, we're going to go there. We're going to, we're going to, uh, enter into that secret garden that you touched and that inspired you so much. And uh, and we will search and find the, the hidden fountain, the sealed spring, which is this place of ultimate uh, meaning and beauty and flow so that each of us can be channels, messengers uh, of... Uh, you know, and 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 a conduit for that flow into the world. So, as you chant these words, just find find within you that that secret garden, and uh, and let the sound of these words take you to the to the hidden fountain. It is there, waiting um, to nourish to nourish us and to nourish the whole world. Last Maria, <laughs> My <laughs> Everybody sing this with us as your vow to go there and bring back the nourishment. Shafta, could you come a little bit closer? It's a little bit hard to hear you and your voices are too beautiful not to be heard. <laughs> Gang Ah, <laughs> 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 
Thank you so much. And for so much more than just this moment, Shefa and Raphael. And uh, you can hear many of Shefa's amazing chants online and in book form and read her commentary on Shir Hashirim. So thank you so much. Uh, Ariel, you're going to close us out. I don't know if you're going to return to your song. I would love to hear it one more time. I don't know if this was the debut, mm -hmm. but it was uh, absolutely beautiful. It might be a nice way to come full circle, to spiral. Everyone is really, um, really uh, proud of the, of the Gilgul of this event, the, the incarnation that this event has, has become. Um, so I will invite us to, to sing the opening song so we can we can uh, we can spiral spiral into a closed circle of sorts. Um, I believe it was just shared in the chat, um, so you all should have access to the to the words. Does everyone have that in the chat? Yeah. Okay. Great. So we're gonna we're gonna close with this, and thank you everyone so much for being here, for being together, and may this be our prayer, a prayer of belonging and of wholeness, and may. All the healing um, of this of this day of this time that we've spent together may it may it be sent out to all the places in the world in the earth and in ourselves that it's that it's needed. If I was a robin, I'd build you. Lay it down softly and slow. If I was a robin, I'd build you a nest, call you through branches back home. If I was a blossom, I'd bloom just for you, opening, falling your gate. If I was a blossom, I'd bloom just for you, dream us to dandy. If I was the moonlight, I'd turn back the tides, shine silver and true on each wave. If I was the moonlight, I'd turn back the tides. Light you a path through the cave. If I was a cornstalk, I'd grow tall and green, rise up to meet all your pain. If I a corn stalk, I'd grow tall and green, inviting you into my shade. If we were a story, I'd tell it again, sing it all night and all day. Tell it again, never tire of the refrain.
Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you, Shefa. Thank you, Mary Evelyn. Thank you, Natan. Thank you, Kaya. Mm -hmm. Thanks to, to Marilyn and Kyle from the Miller Center for their behind the scenes help. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Ellen for her leadership and for the legacy that she has left us. May her soul be bound up in the bonds of life. And thanks to that anonymous author or authors of Shir Hashirim and to the one that authored all of it <laughs> from the beginning to the end. With that, folks, Moadim Lesimcha, for those that are celebrating Pesach, I hope the last day or days are meaningful and that we all experience some measure of liberation, which we so desperately need throughout the world. So take good care.